So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Resdal through the uh, Global Partnership for Security and Peace, or the GP, G, GSPSP, uh, has decided to promote cross-regional conversations with members of the civil society organization and institutional representatives. Welcome to the first interregional civil dialogue about the challenges of civil society in this complex environment. I'm Elisa Rial, and I'll be moderating the conversation for today. We have an exceptional panel of speakers today from Pakistan. We have Amna Kawazar from Pildat. From Brazil, we have Renata Giannini from Igarape. From Nigeria, we have Barbara Maigari. From Ecuador, we have Diego Perez Enriquez from EAAN. And uh, first off, I will start by handling, handing, the, uh, handing over the floor to Dolores Permeolara for opening remarks. Dolores. Thank you, Elisa, on behalf of the RISDAL team in the Global Partnership for Security and Peace Initiative. I would like to thank the distinguished panelists and viewers for joining us in this conversation. According to various analyses, the decline of democracy has taken hold for more than a decade. Among the factors that condition this scenario, we can observe the discontent with democracy, which is evident mainly in the most vulnerable societies. In some cases, that discontent is used as an opportunity for anti-system discourse, often showing a distorted image of reality or altered through disinformation campaigns, provoking the dissolution of democratic values and polarization in societies. In, in the face of democratic decline, we can observe the trend of increasing autocratic regimes. According to Beading Institute of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, 7% of the global population is under authoritarian regimes, with electoral autocracies being the most common. At the same time, liberal democracies have declined from 41 countries in 2010 to 34 in 2021. Anti-democratic leaders once in power follow a pattern of attacking accountability mechanisms in democratic institutions as well as repressing opponents in civil society organizations. This generates a profound weakening of civil society, limiting the ability to monitor and supervise the performance on public institutions and security sector. In an autocratic regime, the use of violence at the domestic and international levels is more likely. A case to be observed is the aggression against Ukraine. This country had been promoting democratic reform, but since February 24th, it has resisted Russia's armed aggression, which violates the basic principles of international law. Eventually, we will see the outcome of this ongoing war. However, now we can observe the severe consequence in the social, humanitarian, economic, and geopolitical spheres. Despite the shortcomings and dilemmas of democracy, we must remember that it was under its umbrella that the international security system and international order were promoted more than seven decades ago. Between its framework, numerous binding agreements and treaties had been signed to promote peace, stability among states and between them and their populations. In this global scenario on the decay of democracy rules and distrust of society, we wonder if democracy is at stake. With this question in mind, Resdal, between the framework of the Global Community of Practice project, initiates this series of conversations with members of organized civil society and institutional representatives from different sectors and regions in order to exchange reflections on the main challenge that civil society is facing, as well to generate ideas on possible strategies and mechanisms that can be undertaken on this regard. Welcome to this first webinar and thank you, you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. So I will turn it over to our first speaker, Amna Kauzar. 
And Anna is an experienced project manager with a demonstrated history of working in the nonprofit and think tank industry. She has been associated with Bell Dot since 2014, and she has served on Pakistan's first ever Prime Minister's National Youth Council. She is the lead manager and curator of Pakistan's first ever Young Politicians Fellowship Program and currently leading in the 17th Youth Parliament in Pakistan. So, Amna, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Restal, uh, for organizing this uh, very important uh, conversation on a very important uh, subject. I'm extremely uh, grateful to be here and grateful to be invited as uh, a panelist and uh, among such, you know, big experts over here. I'd like to share uh, a small presentation, uh, uh, if uh, you would allow me to share my screen. I hope that's all right. So I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay, perfect. So uh, Pakistan Institute of Legislative Development and Transparency, uh, we are an independent nonpartisan uh, think tank, a nonprofit organization, and we have been working in Pakistan since 2002. And as uh, Elisa, Elisa said that I have been associated with this organization since 2014. So it's been uh, over eight years now for me here as well. And uh, it's been quite a journey. We work on strengthening democracy, institutions, and governance in Pakistan. So why Pildat was formed? There were three branches of our state, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary. Uh, for the executive, we have training facilities in Pakistan in various different forms. And for the judiciary as well, we have uh, judicial training facilities as well. But what we did not have uh, before PILDAT was uh, any kind of training facility for our legislatures. And, our, and I'm talking about legislatures at uh, the federal or the central level and at the provincial level, or you can say at the state level. So the no, the no, nothing of that sort existed for Pakistan before um, PILDAT came into being. So keeping that in view, we identified a gap and we filled that, that gap by forming this organization in 2002. Uh, from parliamentary development is how we started our journey. And from there onwards till now, there are many areas of uh, focus that we have uh, developed. Some key areas of focus I've outlined here, parliamentary development and monitoring, assessment of the quality of democracy in Pakistan, elections is a big subject for us. So electoral reforms in order to improve the quality of our elections in Pakistan, inter-institutional relations with special focus on uh, in relations between the civilian and the military institutions, strengthening of political parties, quality of governance in Pakistan, women and women in leadership, especially in political leadership, youth uh, is a big subject. Uh, Pakistan's 64% population is currently under the age of uh, 30 years. So that's a huge uh, youth bulge that we have right now. And then right to information. And of course, the security sector, which included rule of law, counter-terrorism, counter-violent extremism, and peace building. So we worked on parliamentary performance by we every year annually, we uh, review the performance of the parliament. We have an indigenous framework that we've built ourselves. The publications are available on our website and we assess the performance of parliamentarians as well as the performance of the parliamentary institutions uh, themselves as well. And then every year we assess the quality of democracy in Pakistan and we try to uh, quantify uh, that, uh, that score. Uh, we have expert groups formed uh, within the organization that includes people from various backgrounds and we come together and we assess how democracy is doing uh, in Pakistan. So we take that responsibility and uh, we are perhaps the only organization that in Pakistan that uh, actually produces such, such a report and publishes that annually. Then, as I said, electoral process and reforms, Pakistan in its 75 year history has had only 
uh, 11 general elections, which is very unfortunate. Instead of having uh, elections at regular intervals of time and every five years, due to military interventions, uh, our electoral process became extremely weak. So we tried to work on that as well. Then development of political parties as well is something that we work on. We have you know, a large amount of political parties in Pakistan. It's a multi-party system that we have here, a parliamentary form of government. So we thought uh, that this was also an important area of work, specifically working on the internal democracy. So democracy overall in the country and then democracy within political parties as well. And uh, assessing quality of uh, governance as in how is rule of law doing? How is the economy doing? What are, what are other social indicators? Uh, you know, uh, uh, that are, you know, uh, doing well in Pakistan. So uh, how's the administration working, such kinds of thing. And then right to information, something very important. We produce scorecards on uh, the right to information and how the laws are doing and uh, how their implementation is working. Youth, I've already spoken uh, about earlier as well. We, uh, for the last 16 years, we've been running a youth parliament in Pakistan, a one of its kind, unique uh, model uh, that uh, runs uh, after the national, uh, the national parliament of Pakistan. And we bring youth from across uh, part, uh, all parts of Pakistan together and we hold sort of like a mock national parliament and teach them how parliamentary practices are actually done and uh, teach them the ways of the government, how, how the business, uh, legislative business is carried out. And then rule of law as well, we've tried to assess, produced a rule of law index in Pakistan, uh, keeping in mind, you know, where, how much corruption there is, how much how open the government is, how much fundamental rights are being given to uh, uh, citizens in the country, how much law and what is the law and order situation in the country, what is the state of security in the country. So that's also something that we do. And then we have several policies on the security uh, system in Pakistan, including internal security policy and an external security policy. So that also covers counter-terrorism and counter-violent extremism in Pakistan. So we review government's policies and produce regular monitors uh, on them and present our analysis. And then women leadership and women development uh, in Pakistan as well. This is also a very important area of work, the inter-institutional relations. It's very like enduring, uh, you know, as we move along my presentation, I will uh, share a little more about why we actually used to call it state of civil military relations in Pakistan. And then we changed it to inter-institutional relations in Pakistan. So there's a good story behind it, which I'd like to share with you um, as we go on. So how will that works? We do research, we do policy analysis, we do advocacy of our research and policy that we do. We do capacity building of parliamentarians and government officials in our capacity. We bring in experts, in-house experts and outhouse experts and we you know conduct their uh, capacity building on how to be effective parliamentarians in the parliament mm -hmm. uh, some of our key achievements i'd like to share share is that um uh, uh, we have a system of a, a continuous system of uh, training parliamentarians now that were we initially started and now government has adopted that system. It's called the Pakistan Institute of Parliamentary Studies. And over there, that is the government institute now that was formed as a result of our advocacy initiatives and parliamentarians get regular, you know, uh, training and research through that facility. And then on the subject of security, uh, we, um, of, uh, uh, analyzed and monitored the performance of our national security committees that were formed, and we produced an, you know, we we advocated that there should be there used to be no national security committee or body in which the civilian and military institutions can sit down together and discuss uh, the subject of national security. So through our advocacy initiatives, the a national security committee actually exists as a proper government. Uh, body now. And then based on our assessment reports, as I said earlier, government started producing its own performance assessment reports as well. And parliament started producing its annual reports as well, in which they st also started reporting the attendance of their members, the, you know, how many committee meetings are taking place, what is the performance of the committees, what kind of legislation has been discussed in those committees. And then attendance was also something that we were very uh, concerned about that, you know, how are parliamentarians attending those committees. So we did that. 
youth parliament pakistan i've already spoken about this is just a list of uh, research that's available on our website you can uh, check it out and these are some important links that you can connect with bildad so coming uh, quickly to the current situation of civic space and civil society in Pakistan, um, I will, uh, without going into a lot of detail, because I understand I have like eight to 10 minutes to, uh, for this conversation. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are about uh, many different laws uh, under which uh, civil society organizations have to register. And there are uh, four main registration laws uh, across the provinces in Pakistan and at the federal level as well. Registering with the Charity Commission is required in all the provinces. And um, CSOs are not allowed to operate and obtain uh, uh, you know, funding without getting registered by that, which is fair enough, or uh, that's fine. But recently, in 2021, a commission was established under a particular law that's uh, written over here, uh, that um, uh, registration of NGOs can be cancelled or refused, or raids can be conducted on the offices of the organizations without any prior notice. So if the government feels that, no, this we, we don't like this organization, they can go ahead and cancel the registration for that organization. There are several barriers to entry uh, for international uh, NGOs as well. There was a time just a couple of years ago where a number of international non-governmental organizations were working, but uh, the government in 2015, through a particular policy, they asked all the INGOs to reapply for registration through an online registration form, which was very, very um, arbitrary and very, um, um, I would say, very comprehensive thing. And they had to uh, obtain a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with the government in order to function. As a result, many INGOs actually closed down and um, they actually uh, had to uh, you know reapply and then come back again in the in to work in the sector so approved ingos are also you know after consultation with the relevant federal and provincial authorities and in line with the government's uh, priorities only then that's how they're supposed to work uh, so while previously the responsibility of monitoring and clearing the organized NGOs was with the Economic Affairs Division, now the Interior Ministry has taken over uh, the responsibility of uh, taking care of what kind of international non-government organizations can work. And then operational activity. So very recently, in order to regulate uh, the domestic non-government organizations and what kind of foreign fundings they were they were uh, introducing, the, a new policy was introduced in 2021 that we had to sign uh, for every project and build that of course, uh, is an organization that has mostly been running on foreign uh, 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 funding. So for each and every project, you have to get, um, you know, uh, you have to get registered with the Economic Affairs Division. This is something that was not done before. And this was very new to us. And we've been in this rigorous process, this extensive screening that's done from 14 different departments unnecessary screening, including the security agencies as well, and a memorandum of understanding as well, in order to be able to function properly. And this is where I said that I would an interesting story to tell that uh, we had a difficult time registering some of our projects with the uh, Economic Affairs Division because they did not want us to work on civil military relations. But we insisted, we took some legal action as well, and we said that we have to work on this subject. It's a very important subject in the context of Pakistan. And so they said, okay, then change the name of that, uh, you know, that project, call it interinstitutional relations, and don't just cover civil and military, cover all of the institutions in that, you know, all of the government state institutions. So, and, and then uh, also, we have to share details of our, all our donors, which is already there on our website, but we have to separately share it with them, separately share everything about our funding, you know, very personal details about uh, the employees of our, of our organizations, Audit information is always published, it's online, but you have to share them with the security officials separately as well, and they can question on question you on those, uh, you know, um, on your auditing and, you know, even if it's, you know, all done correctly. So yes, and then another very big thing is that CSOs are not permitted 
uh, to work in certain areas, uh, uh, you know, assigned by the government, and they they cannot be defined. They they're very arbitrarily interpreted. So if you want to work in a certain area of Pakistan, you believe that it's an underdeveloped area, but what you have to do is that you'll have to get a no objection certificate from the provincial home department and the concerned district administration of that government. So already you've gone through that whole process of registration, you've gone through the whole multiple screening processes. And then once again, if you have to work in a certain area, you have to go to the home department and you have to get a no objection certificate. So it's a lot of cultural barriers then exist as well for in working, you know, for the work of some NGOs in Pakistan. And that's what brings me that in the Freedom Index of 2022, it's no surprise that Pakistan ranked 157 out of 180 countries, which is very, uh, very low. This uh, Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act as well, which is uh, has been passed. It's a very vague uh, act. And, you know, the government, if it doesn't like your work or if it doesn't approve of uh, uh, any kind of uh, opinion that you're putting out there, uh, they will acquire, you know, certain legal powers to censor that information. And then a new set of social media regulations are also being introduced already been introduced in 2020 up, you know they say that all social media companies are required to disclose any information or data by any investigation agency in pakistan if they requested if they don't provide that information they can find them up to rupees 500 million or they can even ban that uh, completely that social media organization social media company in pakistan so the government decides what's lawful content, what's unlawful content. It's not written clearly in the in the in the laws, in the policies, in the rules, etc. And then resources as well. We are extremely tight on resources. I mean, Pakistan passed an anti-money laundering uh, bill, which was great. It was uh, you know a great law that was passed. It was definitely need of the hour because there is an issue of terror financing in Pakistan, but it deemed all NGOs as that are foreign funding recipients subject to scrutiny regulations and limitations by different regulators. So, you know, you have multiple layers of regulators over here. The State Bank of Pakistan, which is the main, uh, you know, government's uh, uh, bank in Pakistan, it can will no longer clear foreign currency or foreign funding received in our bank accounts unless we have an MOU signed with the Economic Affairs Division and we provide that MOU and I've just told you that economic affairs division makes you go through a hell lot of process. Sorry for using that word, but a huge process. And uh, that's how, uh, you know, you finally get through it and then your funds are cleared. So no, you know, the, it's an unclear registration process with no safeguards against any arbitrary denial of registration. If they have um, denied that, no, we will not sign an MOU with you, they are not liable to giving us any explanation. It's only that we really pushed and asked them that, you know, what's the, what exactly is the issue? So in, only in one case, we were able to find out that please don't use the word civil military relations for your for your projects used any other word and that's how we came up with interinstitutional relations so there are you know certain uh, broad and inappropriate bans on political activities as well you can't just get up and decide and you know okay I'm, i feel for a certain cause i want to you know for women rights for example i want to hold uh, a, a, a protest or a march uh, to propagate the laws uh, to prop you know to promote the laws for right uh, to information for women's uh, movement, uh, they can, you know, come to that area and they can, you know, completely turn it over around. They can even cancel your registration based on that. And there is no, there is no ground uh, to judicial appeal for any kind of adverse decision or action that is taken uh, by the government. So uh, this slide I've pretty much covered that, you know, if you have to gather together any sponta spontaneous assemblies, any spontaneous gatherings that you'd like to do. I mean, I remember there was a time, you know, some 15 years ago, you know, social media was just very new and people used to gather at the, they used to, we used to create Facebook groups and say, okay, we're meeting here at this time and going to protest for this thing that the government has done or this new law that the government has produced. You can't do that anymore. You have to get a license. You have to get approvals from various multiple layers of the government. And even so, if you don't uh, follow the conditions of the license, then your assembly or your procession is canceled there. Um, these, these are my last 
uh, two to three slides. Um, it's on the current project that we are doing, that I'm doing with uh, Restal. It's called Political Regimes and the Role of Security Institutions. Um, and uh, the problem uh, of this problem statement of our research is that in the last three years, we've realized that security institutions, especially the military and police institutions, they have been granted increasing autonomy across many countries, especially in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the MENA region. And because of these autocratic tendencies, we realized that there was very limited qualitative analysis that was being done to sort of provide uh, you know, information and in-depth research on the, those trends. So our objective of this project is to identify and collaborate to positively influence trends which link the security institution's role and their autonomy and to improve the democratic culture in different regions, provide civil society organizations and academics with tools to, you know, reflect on their programs and, you know, to be better prepared to handle uh, such challenging situations and to uh, then collaborate with political representatives and security institutions and talk to them and facilitate on, you know, uh, facilitate their reflection on, you know, look how where the democracy is going. It's, you know, the democratic culture is really being tarnished by that. So if as a result of our research that does come about. So these are some key research questions for uh, what are some of, the, some of the main activities that are undertaken by the military institutions. I know for Pakistan, there are many ac activities that are undertaken by the military institutions in Pakistan. And are they, you know, uh, those activities addressing the main national issues and serving the current needs needs and demands of the citizens or they are they serving themselves and then police institutions as well what are the activities that are taken undertaken by the police institutions what kind of legislation is there what kind of implementation is there and are they also addressing the main national issues and then uh, how, what is the civil society organization? Are they able to really function and manage and respond to these uh, main issues? So we have, uh, uh, you know, from Africa, Asia, Central, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the MENA region, we have these countries, some 10 countries that we've outlined. Pakistan is one of them, Nigeria, Uganda, Indonesia, Hungary, Poland, Colombia, Venezuela, Egypt, and Lebanon. They have been selected upon the basis that their security institutions have have been granted increased economy, certainly in Pakistan's case. And we're looking at, uh, you know, research. We have researchers from these countries as well, and we're compiling that research. And we should, we are hoping to come up with a, a very detailed analytical uh, sort of, uh, you know, a report or a publication or some sort that can really provide some rich information, some rich data, and really reflect on the state of democracy and the state of security in our institutions. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm really sorry if I went overboard with my time. Thank you, Amna. So we'll turn it to our sec uh, before we turn to our second panelist, I just would like to let the Spanish speaking audience know that there is a nice little round uh, world button called interpretation where you will be allowed to see captions for the Spanish translation or for the English translation for those of you who require it, which yeah. Um, for our second panelist, we have Brazil's Renata Giannini. Renata is a PhD in international studies specializing in women's studies. She, she is a senior researcher at the Igarape, and she has where she has been dedicated to understanding democratic backsliding through the curbing of civic engagement and participation, particularly in Brazil where she is responsible for the civic space GPS. She's an experienced training facilitator to security sector institutions. Renata. Thank you, Elise, and thank you, Dolores, for, for the invitation to be here in this quite interesting event. Uh, I was really taken aback by Amna's presentation. So um, basically, just very quickly, the Garapé Institute, where I work um, since 2013, it's a think and do tank, and we are mostly dedicated to the agendas of public security, digital security, and climate security. And we do that through, especially through research, like getting the evidence up there and trying to influence public policies through strategic communications, advocacy, and um, uh, technology as well. 
Now, <clears throat> as we most of us know, uh, Brazil's democratic rule has fallen quite considerably in the past few years. And since then, we also created the civic space program, which I had the honor to coordinate for quite a while. Um, and that's what I would like to speak to you today. Um, right, right in the beginning, when um, let me just close my WhatsApp because I, I, I keep hearing it. I'm sorry. Uh, but right from the beginning, when the current president Bolsonaro was elected, he already announced a, a lot of measures that he would undertake in order to curb civil society action, participation and engagement. Um, Igarapé is one of the institutions that is, that is dealing with a lot of um, issues that are sort of difficult drug policy, our arms and ammunition control, civil military relations, many things that usually that are right in the colliding route of what he is defending. And from the beginning, we were attacked the civil society. And that's new. That's completely new in Brazil. So uh, some of uh, our team received personal threats. And it was it was something that we were not used, you know. We we haven't seen this kind of things in, in a really long time since the military rule ended in 1984. Uh, so we we started to look into that. What's happening, and and how is that happening? And and we see that this authoritarian wave, as the Lord is rightly put from the beginning, is happening not only in Brazil; it's in everywhere. And it is quite different from what we've seen in the past with the tanks on the streets. It's really what many scholars now are, are talking about, like democracies dying from within, being eroded from within, and how this is happening. There's a whole context that, uh, that served as enablers. I think that the very first one was 9-11 and the war on terror that really contributed to curbing civil liberties and freedom. And, and not only that, it's like people accepting it and people like, well, for my security, that, that's okay if that happens. Um, in Latin America, we have the war on drugs that has been happening for a really long time and all the Manodura approaches, very authoritarian and also contributing contributed, I'm sorry, to this enabling environment. And more recently, we had the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemics that also contributed to this state of emergency in which uh, we, we, we have seen in many different countries, the executive powers really increasing their, um, their, their power, centralizing their power. Now, all of these contexts, uh, they really have contributed to a lot of frustration and disbelief in democracy. And, and democracy has been the winning, let's say in, here, uh, the winning <clears throat> uh, rule for, for quite a while. And, and what we're seeing right now is that people are really doubting it. I can say that in Brazil, um, there was a lot of allegations of corruption with the government that led to a lot of polarization. There's the role of social media in increasing that polar polarization. And, and for a moment there in 2016, when we had the president Dilma um, democratically elected, who was impeached, we had this huge polarization. And we thought that the two ends of the polarization was the Labour's party, and PSDB, who is a bit more towards the right, but not really. And we were so wrong because what we, are, we, we did right afterwards in 2018, the other end of the political spectrum showed up. And the other end of the political spectrum is outside the constitutional guarantees of our, you know, of our democracy. It's just savagery. And I'm speaking like, really, it's savagery what's happening right now. Obviously, this has not happened only in Brazil, as I said. But in Brazil, uh, we realized that <clears throat> there was a, a survey that was carried out and 82%, 82% of the population <clears throat> said that they were okay with flexibilizing democratic rule if la their life improved. <clears throat> There's a lot of individualism here going on, of course. But because people were very frustrated, there's economic uh, crisis, there's this political crisis, social crisis, this, all these many crises. And what happens is that these authoritarian populist leaders, they come up during elections 
with a program that says, look, I'm different. I am the third way. I'm not this or that. You know, I'm going to just explode this system and create something new. And people really believed that. So they were democratically elected. That's the thing. But once they are in power, they expand their executive powers. A lot of times they just they <clears throat> dismantle the system of checks and balances that in most countries are done by the legislative and the judiciary power. They order by decree, which means that they, the laws are no longer created by the legislative power. They just create a decree and do whatever they want. Um, and, and very often what they're doing is that they are subverting the mandate of key institutions. So they no longer serve the public end that they were created for. They serve their own interests. And we will talk a little bit more about that and, and the steps that they, they, they follow. But another, another thing that happens, and I'm not pleased, include Brazil in that research, is that they, they, they put the military and the police, in our case as well, in the day-to-day -day routine of politics. And so we, what we have in Brazil right now, for example, is that we have over 6,000 military and police who are occupying civilian posts in different branches of the government, but in, in, in specific ministries that are key for certain agendas. And one is the environment. You see, Amazon is burning right now. And that's because the Ministry of Environment is not really serving the purpose that was supposed to be serving. So as I said, we identified, we looked not only in the, for the case of Brazil, we looked many different cases and we identified that, that there is a sort of playbook that these populist authoritarian leaders, they follow step by step. In some countries, some are a lot more, um, there's a focus in, in, some, in some things and in other countries, others like what Amna was saying about the financing, restrictions of financing. Uh, we haven't seen that yet in Brazil, although there have been a lot of attempts to do that as well. But the good thing is that we have a few institutions that are bravely resisting and the judiciary and the Supreme Court is, is the main one, but also we have a few players within the legislative branch that are also um, doing, are doing that. So because of, of that and uh, uh, of all this context, we created the Civic Space GPS. The Civic Space GPS basically monitors daily the attacks to the civic space, <clears throat> because what we've seen that is also common to all these in all these countries is that there is this shrinking of the civic space. <clears throat> and we understand the civic space as this as this possibility of citizens, organizations, private groups to interact with the government, to influence the political structures around them towards more effective public policies without being hindered, threatened, being just um, able to criticize if that need be. And that's very important for many different reasons, <clears throat> but in a country like Brazil, it's key because we are very unequal country. There are a lot of people margin historically marginalized that have not been able to be in power. So it has always been a fraught democracy of course, but at least we were sort of trying to improve. So the civic space is, 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 is key for groups like the black population, the indigenous population to, to, be, to really look, monitor the government and push for policies that are important to them. So what we, we, do, we did is that we looked uh, everywhere and we, we, we came up with 12 different strategies that are used in different degrees by different authoritarian groups to, to erode democracy. And I'm going to focus more in, in Brazil here, uh, but um, since we started doing this, um, this monitoring, which was in 2020, we've monitored over 2,000 2, attacks to the civic space. What's the most common one? Fake news and disinformation campaigns. And those are key detrimental to sort of brainwash the public opinion towards certain things. 
but it's also to guarantee that there is a constituency that will eventually vote for them or defend their rights. So when they are talking to the evangelical and more religious group, they talk about abortion. And they say that the, the, the ones that are opposite to their politics are in favor of abortion. They defend the gender ideology. They want the whole population to become gay. It's these kind of arguments that 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 not even science cannot, you know, it's just like sci science is completely ignored here. Uh, when they are talking about the agribusiness, it's a it's the environment. So climate change is 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 you know is an invention. It doesn't it doesn't really exist. And and then what we see is that a lot of the legislation that has protected the environment has really I can't see the numbers lady so you can't write you can write down in the chat that I'm gonna look at it uh, <clears throat> and and the communism and and you know like the opposite uh, the, the 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 ones that are going to run against the president they are all communists and, and things like that the second one is intimidation and harassment of people who are <clears throat> against the government and it started with declarations, public declarations of the president, the president, the president making public declarations about many different people, artists, you know, civil society representatives, all sorts of things. But then they started to use the public security and criminal justice system in Brazil to prosecute these people. So there has been an in spike in lawsuits uh, uh, that against people just because they are against the government and they have they have been outspoken about it. The third one is abuse of power, and within abuse of power there are many different kinds. One is using uh, these institutions as 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 I said to persecute people. Uh, secondly, uh, we see uh, these these same institutions uh, being used to defend allies and um, family members that are involved in illegal situations. And the one that is really is really sad to see is that you, we see the public servants being harassed. Um, they are being exonerated. They are suffering disciplinary. Um, processes they are just leaving they are they have a lot of mental problems and they take away uh, people who are technical who are experts in key subjects and put military police or just people who are ideologically aligned to the government we are we've seen this in the, the environmental one in the culture one in the health one so a key ministries for Public for the public interest in Brazil. The other, the other, uh, another tactic is what we call constitutional hardball, which is the rule by decree. So if I can't do something through the legislative, then I'll just make a decree. This was very common. It was done through the whole ammunitions, um, <clears throat> firearms and ammunition legislation that we had. Um, we had a very good legislation. Brazil is the champion of homicides in the world. Over 50,000 people are killed in this country and about roughly 18% by the police. And there he is just letting people have weapons and, and, uh, and why is that? So we're very concerned about the results of the election because we do think that it may happen that uh, people will uh, when if he loses the election, he will have an army or something like that. I know I'm being a bit dramatic, but it's it really is hard. I'm going to end in a minute, but the last thing that I wanted to say is two other strategies that are very common, which is directly curbing civic engagement. There is a reason why Brazil's constitution of 1988 is called the citizenry constitution. It guaranteed this sort of uh, participation uh, councils for every different ministry. So we had the civil society, uh, an official channel for civil society to directly make inputs and influence public policies. He just said, well, we no longer need them. And they, most of them don't exist anymore. Uh, and the final one is censorship. We're seeing a lot of censorship uh, journalists not uh, being being sued.
people not being uh, free to to speak out if they are uh, if they work in, in, in the government they are classifying a lot of documents and they are weakening our the, the our freedom of information law which all of us is you know we can ask for information from the government get data analyzed and whatever and, and that's very important for organizations who are monitoring what the government is doing my final point here is that there has been a very strong uh, narrative attacking the integrity of the electoral system and why is that uh, if he loses the election upcoming elections in october this year then he's already destroying the belief in the electoral system so it's a way of maintaining power so there are two trends here we see a spike in political violence so a lot of defamation campaigns and even physical violence assassinations happening against political opponents and on the other side these very strong narratives against the electoral system they even tried to pass a bill uh, that was about printed ballots, for Christ's sake, because we've, we've had electronic well, electronic system for quite a while and they are just ruining it. And now they're trying to put the military to sort of control the elections. Uh, it was a confusion, my, my thing here. But just to say that restricting civic participation, restrict censorship, abuse of power, constitutional hardball, intimidation and harassment, dismantling the system of checks and balancing, centralizing power. These are steps undertaken by all autocrats that are in power, and we need to be really uh, careful and watch for them. Thank you. Thank you once again, Renata. Um, uh, Diego, Barbara, I'm very sorry that we're going, going to have to go to, into overtime. Uh, just uh, we'll, do, we'll do what we can with that. So um, our third panelist today is Barbara Maigari. And so Barbara is a human rights advocate with over 19 years of experience. Her focus area is on the rule of law, human rights, gender advocacy, and CSO accountability. She has worked over the years in the non-governmental sector, ensuring justice reforms and human rights promotion. My Gadi is a fellow of the Justice Initiative and Cody Institute. Barbara? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me over for this webinar. Um, so my talk, uh, I'm going to group some of the issues uh, I see with civil society across um, on democratic issues. I'm going to group into two. Um, one, I will look at it from what are some of the democratic operations. I'm not, I'll look a bit into the West African region. Um, and, then, and then the second problem would address issues of internal civil society workings. Uh, the first thing I would say, when I was having a discussion uh, last week with Dolores, and I was asking the question, first, what is democracy for the global South? What's democracy for Africa? So what's democracy for Nigeria, for instance, where I come from? Is it what the West has told us democracy is? Is it third term or second term? Is it possible to deliver governance, for instance, in eight years? If yes, um, can, can we see where that has happened? I would say it's possible in some situations that I have seen uh, in Nigeria. It's possible for, for, for some part of governance to be delivered within a period of, um, of eight years. Is democracy a combination of parliamentary, presidential, monarchical system? We have the British government has a parliamentary system, yet countries, most Anglophone countries in Africa uh, were colonized by Britain, but we have a presidential system. Can we then say that democracy has helped, has failed in all African countries? If yes, then what of Botswana? Botswana currently has a president that is running a third term. However, Botswana has affirmative action. 35%, most of the government, most of the members of the government are women. Can we then say democracy has failed in such a country? I think for me, the first thing is to say, we need to define what it is. What is it specifically? Would we also say that Libya was better before or now? Is it better now? 
that Gaddafi is no more? Or was it better when Gaddafi was there? We see a lot of things happening in the West African region. Third term bits have been very common. In particular, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, Guinea-Bissau, third term bits have been very common. And of course, going contrary to the constitutions of those countries. And just this is just to paint a scenario of what is in some of these countries. Then we now begin to talk about how civil society is surviving in such in such countries. Um, the third term bid we had, of course, in Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, you had 44 contenders, and yet the, the national electoral body just um, allowed, declared only four, four people, authorized only four people to contest for that position. And of course, Watara ended up winning his third term bid. Alpha Conde of Guinea-Bissau also won third term bid. And of course, there has been uh, criticisms and oppositions against that. We've also seen in certain countries, like in 2018, where we saw Jacob Zuma resigning, of course, based on criticisms from his party and different allegations of mismanagement and corruption. We've seen problems with issues of freedom of assembly, expression, and protest. Sudan has, has had, I think, one of the longest protests for us here in the African continent. But Nigeria 2020 had a protest also. The ends has protests basically challenging democratic issues, particularly with police reform. Initially, it started as police reform, but it became broader into the democratic uh, problems. We've also seen elections on the basis of regionalism. Burkina Faso in 2020 had its election, excluded one part of the country and voted the president. And sadly enough, well, maybe better um, in the sense of because of the exclusion, Burkina Faso then had a coup this year. Uh, of course, based on the criticisms from those who felt excluded from the democratic uh, process. We've had countries like Kenya where, and, and Ghana where the opposition challenged even the electoral body. Uh, someone earlier was talking about the independence of the national electoral bodies. The opposition in, in Ghana last year was challenging whether, whether the national electoral body will be able to conduct a free fair election in that country. Of course, the election has, has held. Uh, in recent times in Nigeria, for instance, the Independent Electoral Commission kind of has tried its best. We've seen some level of improvement in the recent election on Saturday in one of the states. The hope is let it replicate itself across the country when the national elections come. Looking outside even the African um, continent and how others how the workings and the democracies in other countries um, that we tend to copy from affects the region. How has Brexit affected some of these countries? How has the US immigration laws affected countries like ours that tend to be copying and pasting what those democracies are doing? For instance, how has what has happened in, in, in the US, 6th of January, 2021, if I'm not mistaken, or 6th January, we all know the date. How has it influenced even the coups that took place in 2021 in West Africa? Strangely enough, almost all the, all the coups that took place last year and into this year at the West African region. So you have Chad, Mali, Guinea, and Sudan. And then you have Burkina Faso, and then an attempted coup sometime in February in, in Guinea-Bissau. And there, correlations could could some of those countries be learning from from the big developed countries and if those countries have succeeded why not how 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 is it likely that what russia is doing to ukraine might affect another country in the global south and then apart from that we also see right violations across the countries particularly in our own african uh, region discriminatory practices across different groups we see military involved in day-to-day -day security runnings. And then we see huge security funding with limited impact on securing the country. For instance, I talk here, particularly looking at Nigeria, one quarter of our budget for the past, if I'm not mistaken, for the past nine to eight years has been on security. How secured is the country? And then we also see arbitrary and questionable judicial change of leadership, nepotism in appointing of judicial heads. We've recently for the past, I think if I'm not mistaken, in the current government, um, we've had two judicial heads, one removed and one resigned. 
That's the third arm of government. How does that even affect the democratic space? Now, for me, these are issues that we should ponder on and understand what is happening within the African continent. Then the subsect, the subsector is then the civil society in such a very tight and challenging space. How can civil society uh, enjoy itself? How does the civic space relate with governance and the democratic processes? What do we see? Some time back, I know that Ethiopia and Kenya passed now, for, I'm, I'm, I'm going into the second problem now, the workings within the civil society. Some time back, I think around 20, 2010 thereabout, Ethiopia passed the NGO regulatory law which regulates a lot with respect to, to non-governmental organizations and the, the scenario that also kind of plays there. I remember ACO, which is the Human Rights Council in Utopia, um, which was all over the country, like we have in Nigeria, the civil society, the civil liberties organization was, was, was crushed just because of a, an NGO regulatory law that stifles funds and excessive powers and restrictions and doesn't allow civil society and non-governmental organizations to exist. Kenya replicated such a law years after, I think the Kenyan law is about 2014, if I'm not mistaken, but the same kind of law. Nigeria has made attempts severally to, to pass the law. The last attempt was 2019 and it has died a natural death. We hope it never resurrects again because normally after every, once a new government comes in, the assembly introduces, the parliament introduces that, that bill. We hope it doesn't take place again. Um, other issues also include internal accountability mechanisms. So apart from the fact that we have these restrictions and regulations from governments, what internal processes do we have within the civil society, if I may even use within the non-governmental organizations? How are accountability processes? How do we ensure accountability across uh, all the all the processes that we do, funding, even accountability to the beneficiaries that we engage with, that is also a challenge. Um, from the government perspective, there's still multiple regulations. So in the Nigerian context, for instance, several registrations you do, apart from the registration as a company existent in Nigeria, you have to register um, the relevant things, you have the pension regulations, you also have the tax regulations, you also have to declare to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. And then if you belong to a state that has a state law, you have to go through that state law. Unfortunately, if you are within the northeastern part of Nigeria, where there is terrorism and counterterrorism efforts, there are specific regulations that you also still have to follow. And, you know, who knows, maybe in the future, other things uh, might come up. Um, another issue that we see is funding is directed. For me, I find that within the Nigerian context, for years now, funding has been directed to the regular CSOs, even if they're not accountable, even if the impact is not visible. Who, um, you tend to see that there might be certain level of civil society organizations at the grassroots level, at the state level, that might do some work that has impact, but nobody to amplify what they're doing. And then you, so for me, the, the, the donors and the funders are also guilty of uh, not making as much impact as the, at the, at the grass uh, root level. And so you keep seeing certain organizations are funded to keep on doing work, even if quote unquote, they might not be as accountable or their work is not as beneficial as, as one would expect because of the magnitude of, of the grants that they get. Um, there are also restrictions and challenges that we see across, uh, especially for civil society organizations. And not only civil society, but also not only non-governmental organizations that are former, but even as citizens to freely enjoy and understand and coexist as a society. Always putting at the back of your mind that the democratic society is what has been painted before, what I said, with all the turmoil that we see around. Freedom of expression is a challenge, association and assembly. In 2020, during the Nigerian uh, NSAS protest, the NSAS hashtag NSAS protest was an online protest by Nigerians who felt aggrieved by the improper processes and procedures of the Nigeria police force. Um, in the process, citizens understood that it wasn't just about police. It was about poor governance because police also 
express their challenges. It was about, yes, there are issues on policing, there are rights violations, there are governance issues, citizens also challenge the government in power, and it led to different issues. One of it was the loss of lives of people in a particular place, the Lekki in particular in Lagos. People lost their lives. To date, no account has been given to that, although there have been uh, judicial panels that have sat and said there is need to attend to that and listen to people. People have lost their lives in the course of, of, of that. Uh, in, the, in the course of that also, um, Twitter supported the, the protests and created a hashtag logo, uh, created a logo. And because of that, the government felt that Twitter supported Nigerian protesters contrary to government's um, agreement to that. And so Twitter was banned for months uh, in country. I think, I can't remember when it, the ban was lifted. The ban was finally lifted. And just, I think, three, four days back, the economic, uh, the ECOWAS court, the Economic uh, uh, Commission of the West African States, the court of justice of that uh, commission, declared that the Twitter ban was illegal and it was a violation of the rights of citizens. And I think it has woken citizens up to say, oh, yeah, we have a right to to challenge what government does. We have a right to even protest. We have a right to assemble and challenge what we feel is, is, is wrong with, with, with the governance process across our country. So just to mention some of those challenges and to highlight that in the midst of all this, um, countries like Nigeria, countries even like Mali, particularly like in the Nigerian situation, influx of, of uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism, different types of terrorist groups uh, creating different cells at, across the country in with kidnappings, killings, uh, bombings. We had a recent jail attack. Uh, it was the jail was bombed. And in the midst of such things, you still have um, civil society existing. So you can just imagine what, what, what we go through. For me, it's a call for concern and it's something that needs to be addressed. And I question, I'm one of those that is questioning the continuous existence. How then would, how does, um, how does the coup in some of these countries, how does the third terms in some of these countries affect the continuous democratic state of these West African countries? And I will yield back uh, to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, so our last panelist will be Diego Perez Enriquez. Uh, Diego is a doctor in political science from the Universidad de Belgrano, Buenos Aires, 2016. He is also a master in international relations from the Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar from Quito in 2004. He's a tenure professor in Ecuador's Instituto de Altos Estudios Nacionales at the School for Security and Defense in 2010. Diego? And again, sorry about going over time. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Uh, and in fact, I'll try to, to, to stick to the times uh, so, so we have some, some time for, for the questions you, you prepare. But uh, for starters, I want to thank you all uh, for, for the invitation and for, for, for putting me in, in this panel with these distinguished uh, guests. And, well, it will be it will be quite interesting to to share some some ideas about about democracy from Ecuador. Um, and the first uh, thing that I want to state is that uh, democracy is in stress in Ecuador. As you may know, uh, Ecuador just uh, went through a very very harsh moment of uh, civilian protests of, of citizens protests uh, just in June 2022. Uh, there were 18 days of strikes that uh, may be uh, interpreted as the continuation of those protests, uh, the, of the protests that we have in, in October 2019. Now, the thing uh, the, in common about these protests is the polarization uh, that, that represent in the, in the Ecuadorian case. You know, uh, Ecuador has has had a, a very, very strong, very particular polarization 
between uh, some leftist movement uh, related to the president or ex-president Correa and um, whoever else is on the other side. And that in, in 2019 and now in 2022, that has meant um, a, very, a very strong and very um, fragile condition for democracy because it has meant uh, the de delegitimization of, of democracy as itself while using uh, democratic uh, processes. You know, and this might be uh, um, an oxymoron. This may be. This may sound as a as a contradiction in itself. But the the, the thing is that the uh, Ecuador's constitution has uh, implemented several uh, processes that may uh, allow a uh, change in the presidency. Uh, and while this may be constitutional, uh, it it ends affecting democracy. And, and, and this was um, the scenario that we had in June, 2022. But uh, I think that um, regardless of the particularities of the, of the constitutional processes, um, it may be interesting to see polarization as, as, this, uh, as one of the symptoms of, of the problem that democracy has in Ecuador. You know, uh, ideology uh, is gonna have a cleavage, yeah? But uh, it seems that it's uh, only related to whoever holds the power and not necessarily uh, relates to ideological per se, ideological issues per se. So that, that may be a problem, you know, and that may be one of the, of the symptoms of, of this problem with democracy. Now, the other thing that, that uh, is related to these uh, protests, but also is related to day-to-day -day, uh, life in Ecuador, relates to the high level of violence that it seems that may be getting higher in each, in each time and in each uh, process, pro uh, in each protest process. So um, in October 2019 or in June 2022, uh, these protests had um, lots of actors uh, mixed within the same protest, and all of them were uh, trying to um, provoke certain results while while using uh, while resorting to to levels of violence that were not seen before. So that gives an idea that the stakes are, are higher, that the possibility of, of, the of the government to control protests and the willingness of the protesters to overthrow government are both at the, at the higher end of the, of, the, of the scope. And that means that uh, probabilities for, for um, a breach in human rights and the probabilities for a breach in uh, order, um, in the, in, the, in the state are higher than ever. So um, this uh, has meant a renewal in the demands of a sector of the population for military intervention, uh, for military intervention and a military seize of power to be, to be more exact. And of course, that, that's, that's meant uh, that the military has been put under additional stress. In Ecuador, uh, the military generally, uh, constitutionally, has uh, a mission regarding uh, protection of the borders. But uh, historically, uh, before the 20, 2008, 2008 uh, constitution, Ecuador's, Ecuador's constitution allowed the military to be a part of uh, what was called the guarantee of the constitutional order. Now, uh, since 2008 constitution, this has changed. Uh, the military is limited to, to border control uh, missions. However, uh, through the exceptional, um, through the use of uh, a state of ex exception, you know, a constitutional state of exception, uh, the military has been used to, to quell, to quench these protests. And that has meant uh, lots of uh, uh, civil rights abuses and several 
several conditions in which uh, the military has been put in a spot where uh, some other type of decision is impossible. But that, uh, that said, uh, population has also demanded for the military to intervene and to seize power, which leads us to uh, certain problems, uh, which I uh, try to, to categorize as, as the shortcomings of, of, of the democracy, which in fact are not shortcomings of democracy, but uh, shortcomings of the governments. And the governments uh, have, have had uh, several problems uh, completing or conducting an agenda that may, may resolve the problems for which they were elected in the first place. And that has meant uh, that um, disappointment with the governments has been transferred to uh, so has been transferred uh, to the democracy. So um, they have become uh, disappointment, disappointments with democracy. And of course, uh, this has led to higher stress due to poli political pol polarization. Um, inequity problems have not been resolved. So uh, Ecuador is now a more inequitable uh, democracy and a more, uh, there's uh, more inequity. And uh, the operation of international organized crime has, uh, has had also um, uh, and and uh, uh, um, ah, I'm sorry, I lost the word here. Um, the the operation of international organized crime has had a, an impact in the operation of several institutions, uh, whereas uh, also uh, in the operation in certain and or in large sections of the country. So um, that has meant an, an additional problem for democracy or for the governments actually to resolve. But as I said uh, earlier, uh, democracy seems to be the, the end part of, of, to receive the, the, the hardest part of the harshest part in all of this. So um, trying to, to summarize all of this in one minute, um, I think that there is a need for critical thinking, for more critical thinking, and that needs to, to take place uh, in the government, in decision makers, and also in civil society. And now uh, the problem with civil society is that they need to, be, to become more engaged with democracy and to re start recognizing what democracy really is about. And, and that, that well, sends us back to the problem of uh, the demands of some parts of the people to, for military intervention, Whereas uh, some other parts of the population of the citizens uh, resort to violence as a way to have their voices heard. So in, in that sense, I think that uh, there is a need for more strict accountability, but also uh, for more involvement of, of people in democratic processes. And that, that means uh, the political parties need to leave uh, this that Maurice Duverge uh, called the swamp in, in, in terms of how the political parties tend to, to moderate or manipulate their, their political positions uh, so they, they can please everyone. But also uh, there is a higher need to um, understand what is really possible regarding uh, the government and what is really possible regarding or regardless of uh, the political position and the political ideology that, that each actor is representing. So um, not all the problems may be solved by the other political party, whichever this is, but um, people uh, need to um, sort of uh, restart, uh, re rebrandish the, um, Refurnish, I'm sorry, the, the, the civil society and the state uh, pact. But those are like the preliminary ideas. And now I'm, I'm going to leave it uh, for the questions for any more ideas. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Diego. Uh, and speaking of questions, uh, we just received a question in the mail, in the email about uh, civil societies. Um, in this case, for every single one of you has only one minute to answer this question, considering that we've gone over time. Um, 
it, considering uh, what is going on with the world and all of the context that you've given us, what would you guys um, advise of civil societies that were just established over the years versus a civil society that is just forming right now and just started? Um, anyone would like to start? Sure, you. I'm muted. Sorry. You. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, I think that uh, the very first thing that that probably needs to be to be done is to leave the mirage of the of the political polarization. You know, uh, to to leave the idea that. Uh, only a certain ideology, whichever this may be, uh, may resolve the problems. I, I think that the states are, are facing problems that transcend uh, this, this uh, ideological cleavage. And I think that for starters, at least in the Ecuadorian case, there is a need for a new uh, civil society and state pact uh, that may May set uh, certain certain objectives, certain certain uh, points of arrival uh, for uh, the whole of society. Apart from that, there are at least three three key aspects. No, that the security, um, and that means the, the the fight against organized international organized crime. The second one is uh, institutional uh, depuration. I mean, the, the institutions need to streamline their processes, but also they need to become more accountable and more capable of, of answering to, to people's demands. And in third place, I think that there is a need uh, to recognize that um, democracy, in spite of all its problems and all of, all of its shortcomings, Democracy is the only way that uh, people's demands may be heard and may be processed. Thank you, Diego. Anyone else? Yes. Um, can I can I go ahead? Sure. Well, okay. Uh, so uh, organizations that are presently working in the security sector uh, reforms, uh, I think they can particularly improve if they keep in mind a broader definition of security in their assessments, which may include police and legislature, as well as all the conventional institutes as well, because people are more likely to come into uh, contact with these institutes on a more day to day basis that for such measures might be more relevant to them if they include these uh, institutes and then uh, create within themselves civilian expertise in the matter of defense. For example, if civilians and legislators were to be more involved in the overseeing of military processes like the uh, budget the, for the defense uh, sector, for the security sector. And they demonstrate the importance of security sector reforms at a local level so that they may hold more relevance to people and that they may be motivated to take uh, ownership of these reforms and for organizations uh, that are just starting and they can they should uh, that, are, that are just new in the organization they should prioritize democracy and good governance when assessing the security sector and include the civilian leadership as much as possible as key stakeholders in any of the discussions that are taking place on this top uh, topic so like a multi-actor approach is necessary to understand that security is not just the responsibility of one institution in society and then again developing strong ties at the local level developing a safe environment uh, that's open to criticism uh, taking a multi-dimensional approach to security and understanding the extent beyond physical uh, protection that also encompasses food security health security and economic security thank you thank you thank you very much amna i'll um, go next well, means very Renata. quickly <laughs> uh, for the, first of all, I just wanted to highlight the role of civil society more broadly. While there's civil society lively, a live civil society, we, we it's good. It's pretty good. Uh, civil society is sort of the, the historical memory of any country. You know, governments change, things change, but civil society is always there fighting for their rights. Um, and um, I would say two things. One, 
coalitions, you know, identify who are really fighting against any sort of uh, violations, either in the government, in the private sector, or other civil society. It makes the the you know the strategies a lot lo a lot more stronger. Uh, people can civil society can provide technical expertise, can support in so many different ways, um, and at the same time. I think uh, in, in contexts where censorship is very strong, making uh, alliances with international organizations such as the United Nations, OECD, so many others that can exercise real pressure on governments. Uh, for new so civil society, go together in a united front with others so that you don't have a target on their back, but keep fighting. Thank you, Renata. Barbara? Yes, please. I'll be the last, <laughs> but not the least. <laughs> Just to mention uh, very quickly that I think for, I think generally it's for all, whether for new civil society organizations or existing ones, I think importantly is to ensure that they contextualize their work. Sometimes copy and paste doesn't, most times copy and paste doesn't work. What happens, uh, what worked in Ghana might not work in Burkina Faso and vice versa. It is, it's important to contextualize your work. Networking is very key. Um, working in silos has proved not to be, to be effective. More importantly, that you never know where you would need the other civil society organizations. It's also imp important to remain um, independent and focus on your area of work. Uh, independent by also calling government to account. Sometimes it's difficult because the sector you're dealing with a regimented uh, space and also you're challenging the status quo of government and securities within the powers of the government. But it's important to continue to be accountable because that's the, that's you're the third force. Um, if that is not done, then the citizens would, would have lost hope. Uh, and lastly, also to emphasize on when engaging, I would say civil society organizations, when engaging with the security sector is to emphasize on community intelligence gathering in, in countries like in Africa here in Nigeria in particular, where the problem we have has to do with um, kidnappings, terrorism, insurgency, without the community information and intelligence will not be gotten. Um, security agencies cannot work in isolation. They have to rely on that. So for me, I think that's one area uh, that CSOs could engage with, with the security sector when, in, when, when, when doing their work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, uh, considering that we're a bit over time, we could end it here or we could ask one last question. Um, and do you, are you guys open for one last question? <laughs> Okay, then. Um, how do the political tendencies of the United States and Western Europe influence your region? I think I'd mentioned that in my initial presentation, I think it has an effect a lot, even if it's not um, written or codified anywhere. But you would find people say, oh, so it can happen in America, then it can happen here. And we don't know how that affects countries that are even struggling to understand what democracy is. Um, I, I'm, I'm not here to say it has, but we saw what happened in Sri Lanka. Who knows whether it was because of what happened in the White House, I mean, the parliament, the Capitol Hill that affected that. Um, although reasons best known to Sri Lankans, maybe that might have been for the purpose of uh, governance and they were challenging the status quo. But I feel for the global South and I feel talking from my own context, um, it actually does affect whatever happens. For me, even the fact that um, the fact that Russia is doing what's doing to Ukraine, what then would happen to countries like ours if you feel the um, Nigeria is tag, quote and unquote, the giant of Africa. If Nigeria feels threatened by any other country can decide to do anything, with any of the African countries. So I feel it does affect, by the way, the economies of those countries determine the economies of the world. So definitely I feel it's not only security wise, um, even food security. So what's happening in Ukraine is affecting us currently in Nigeria, inflation is quite high. There are food uh, supplies that come from those parts of the world. Fertilizer, I hear recently Nigeria was lamenting one of the fertilizer producing countries 
That's a visual. Oh shit. Uh, Barbara, you're frozen. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Something. Um. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. I think she might be disconnected. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> well. Um. In the meantime, since we're running over time, uh, one minute each, and then we'll do some closing remarks about the school. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll say a few words. Um, I, I think that uh, problems uh, faced by the United States and the Western world in general, they're um, uh, just like the Western world is much more advanced and Pakistan is a third world country. Uh, we face far more serious problems such as poverty and civil military imbalance and unstable political situation and a democracy which is far from mature. However, it is uh, not to say that we don't face similar issues such as gun violence or domestic violence or you know, healthcare issues. These are usually on a much larger scale uh, than in the US. And even though such problems are prevalent in our society, re the reality is that we do not have the resources to address them or to give them you know, due importance. And um, it can also be further said that Pakistanis seem to be following an anti-US rhetoric. Um, and it's preached by political leaders, um, the, our current political leaders and our leaders in the past. So uh, we have a very uh, checkered history with uh, you know, our affairs with the United States. So drone strikes and US involvement in the Pakistani foreign affairs and regime changes has made the Pakistani population, I would say, less likely to be influenced by the regressive social trends in the US. So it's a it's important to note that being involved in regime change, the US does play a key role in destabilizing civil military relations, which ultimately has a negative impact. But then regressive trends like the abortion laws that have been overturned in the US, that kind of conversation does start, uh, you know, trigger a conversation in, in Pakistan as well. So in that sense, I would say um, it's affected. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Diego, last remarks. I know that you need to go and that we've gone over time. We're very sorry. No, don't worry. It's okay. I mean, it's it's quite interesting to, to hear all the colleagues from, from all over the world. I think that um, these, these regressive trends that, that you were asking about uh, have, a, have a very specific impact in, in the Ecuadorian case. One from the uh, symbolic side, uh, because... Uh, it may reflect the idea that uh, anything is possible and that you may act in, in, in any sense that you want and you may not get punished by it, you know? So, um, I mean, there's, a, there's an, a notion, I think, that uh, you may increase violence, you may increase uh, the, the, the notion of restricting rights, uh, fundamental rights. And that goes for either those who are in government or those who are protesting in the streets. But it seems that uh, the, the limits are moved uh, above and beyond and you can, you can do anything uh, without suffering the consequences. So that may be one of the, of the symbolic notions, but I think that there is also a very uh, substantial notion that that is being moved by by all of this uh, by this shift in the in the in the democratic trends and that is uh, the one that that I referred in, in a while ago uh, regarding the polarization the ideological polarization I think that there's a a, a notion that um, everyone may become your enemy just because uh, they are seeing things differently. And I don't know, this, this reminds me of, of the tales of Gulliver, the, the, the story. But uh, the thing there is that, uh, yeah, it may seem that uh, this, this uh, heinous uh, speech, you know, the, the, the notion that everyone may become your enemy just because they disagree with you, has, it, it's, it's seeping through society. And that is, become, that is making things very hard for democracy to work. So I think that's one of the of the things that we have to to take care of, and, and we have to be very 
very actively uh, working on. Thank you. No problem. Renata? Well, my colleagues, I think we're very thorough in this in the, in this response. I, I, perhaps I will just highlight one thing that they actually have already mentioned. And the fact is that whatever is the best form of ruling for this the global south, we don't know yet what this ruling is. And democracy is still the, the, the best one we've got. And it's inspired in the Western world it's inspired in them. And so whatever happens there has a direct consequence in our countries, that's for sure. Um, especially in Latin, I mean, for sure in Latin America. And uh, um, the, what, what happened in the Capitolio, for example, it has been picked up and cited directly by the president several times here. Whatever happened in the Capitolio may just happen here if I lose election, that's sort of a threat. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of uh, contagion going on. Excellent, thank you all. Thank all of you for your presentations and for answering the questions and for your time and patience. I know we've gone over time maybe you, and some of you need to go. So I'd like now to invite Dolores to provide the closing remarks. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, I just want to thank Ana, Amna, Renata, Barbara, and Diego for your important reflections. We know there are a lot of questions about this, this complex, complex issue. So we, the, from Resdal, will continue to promote the discussion in order to find some answers. I just want to, to conclude, I, wa I just want to share with you that Resdal is promoting a series of initiatives to achieve this goal to strengthen civil society. So we invite all those who are interested in participating in the School of Supervision of the Security Sector as a tra training course. Uh, the applications remains open until July 24th. So please feel free to send any questions you have. So thank you everyone for attending and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you all.